Thank you everyone for joining. My name is Rick Burke. I'm the co-founder and executive editor of STAT, the digital publication that covers health and medicine. Uh, we of course could be having this panel, having this discussion in the pre-COVID uh, era because we were already facing a chronic disease public health crisis. Now with the overlay of COVID, which this week in recent days is only spreading at more alarming rates, we need to more urgently think about how we pr prioritize chronic disease in this new world we're in right now. So let's go right to it. We have a, a really impressive panel today of leaders in their fields who each bring a unique uh, perspective to the discussion. Um, so I'm going to introduce the panel one by one with a question, and then we'll go on to a broader um, group discussion, and I promise it will be a lively discussion or you get my, you get your money back. Um, first, let's go with, um, I want to introduce Susan Bailey, who's president of the American Medical Association. Susan is an allergist immunologist from Fort Worth. Hi there, Susan. Um, let me just ask you straight, straight away, what's the most frequent question you hear from doctors right now regarding their challenges facing, in terms of facing chronic disease and, and COVID. Hi, Rick, and let me just take this opportunity to give brief thanks to the Milken Institute for, for having me join you this afternoon. Uh, the question the AMA is hearing from doctors most often is how can they continue to take care of their patients, all of their patients, safely? Um, how do they keep their offices running during the pandemic? How do they get PPE, which is still in very short supply in some places? How do they uh, adapt to telemedicine uh, from a primarily face-to-face -face practice? Um, and how can they benefit from of the various um, programs, financial benefit programs uh, from the federal government, like the Paycheck Protection Program and, and the CARES Act. Doctors want to take care of their patients and they need help keep it, their practices going. Great, thanks so much. Next up, we have Garth Graham, Vice President of Community Health at CVS Health. Garth is a cardiologist and professor of medicine and authority on social determinants of health and health equity. Welcome, Garth. Uh, as we all know, COVID has highlighted inequities in the healthcare system. What's the single big, busy, biggest obstacle that you see for protecting people who are already dealing with inequities? Oh man, thanks, Father Rick. And I wanna echo Susan's um, um, words of thanks to the Milken Institute for having me and all others here to talk about these very important topics. So. You know, really, if I was gonna to try to boil down a very complicated situation in one word, I'd say access. You know, access is means so many things to so many different people. Um, but in this particular scenario, we're talking about access to care, access to testing, access to information. Access in many ways sometimes equates equality, which is what I think you hear the national conversation around right now in terms of how do we give people um, and allow people the ability to um, access care, access all the kinds of things um, that would make them live uh, longer, healthier lives. Access, as we all know, is all, all, already a huge issue before COVID. How much, how much more complicated is it now? Oh my goodness. You know, I think um, COVID has complicated um, the scenario in, in so many different ways and the challenges is costing lives. You know, one of the things that we have seen in particular, and I know Susan and others um, working with the clinical community are seeing similar things is where People have delayed care because of COVID. So one thing is the impact and the morbidity and mortality caused by COVID. And then there's this huge, massive um, um, you know, wave coming behind us where people have delayed both uh, primary, secondary care um, in terms of preventative care and other kind of vital care. And we see that um, in terms of you know, cancer, diabetes, heart disease. And so um, one of the things that's been a major concern for us, major concern for CVS, in fact, um, uh, today we're launching a major initiative um, called Time for Care. And it's really a call to action for CVS Health um, to mobilize communities around um, uh, you know, getting involved and in prioritizing preventative care and prioritizing their own personal health care. Because again, uh, Rick, you know, this concept of access is really definitional um, for communities across the board, but certainly more so for minority and underserved communities. Well, I think that, um, I appreciate that. And, and I think the access question is, 
critical. We'll get back to that in the conversation. There's plenty to talk about. Let me um, now introduce Jana Remes, an economist and partner at the McKinsey Global Institute. Now, Jana, in a, in a study that's soon to come out that I had a chance to, to read, you quantify that there's an upside to focusing on health as an investment with social and economic benefits. Um, you also say that with COVID, there's not, no better moment to invest in healthcare or in global health to promote prosperity. Why now when we have all these practical questions right now of just getting people to their doctors? Why invest? Well, we actually think that this is a once in a generation opportunity to really create change that I think people like Susan and Garth have wanted to do for a long time of investing on broad-based health. Yet now is the time when health is at the top of everyone's agenda. It is both the case, obviously, in healthcare, where people are extremely busy with, with the COVID work, but it is also far beyond that. I'm an economist, and health has not entered discussion on, on economic growth before mm. the COVID pandemic. However, it's very clear that every year, poor health reduces global GDP by 15%, which is two to three times the estimated cost of COVID this year. So this is getting the, the, the COVID has made basically health a core question for economists, for economic growth, for recovery from this crisis. And given the changes we are seeing in the healthcare uh, system itself, which there's a lot of improvement on innovation on the, on the pharmaceutical side of, for example, on vaccines, as well as on the delivery, because hospitals have had to do so much more with the, with, the, with the resources they have. It really is an opportunity to invest, not just for the short term, but for long term, for real broad-based health and prosperity. Thanks, Jana. And we'll get back to discussing more of that as, as the, the, our time goes on. Let me now welcome Brooks Tingle, the President and Chief Executive Officer of John Hancock Insurance. Brooks, um, great to have you here. And could you talk about um, how insurance and how you fit into this discussion as a first off question? Yeah, sure, Rick, thank you. And, and thanks to everyone for, for having us here today. It, you may be wondering, a, a life insurance company, I, I guess there's probably an obvious way a life insurance company would be relevant in the midst of a, a pandemic. We, we certainly are paying a lot of um, death claims, unfortunately, for the, our, our customers. Um, and we're getting tremendous insights into, unfortunately, who is succumbing to the virus. Um, I, I know I personally spent a lot of time actually reviewing the claims. It's easy when you watch the news and, and you know, we all probably have a bias towards statistics and such things um, to kind of maybe lose touch with the personal aspect of it. And I review a lot of these claims looking at the stories of the people, very touching situations. I've seen many instances where a husband and wife will pass away within four or five days of each other uh, from COVID. So, so one, as a life insurer, we're certainly involved on, on the very back end of everything. Um, but, but much more meaningfully, I think, or not more, but very meaningfully going forward, we're looking at this and, and we've, been, we've been asking ourselves for a while, shouldn't the life insurance industry be at the table on these matters of chronic disease uh, fighting, prevention, improvement. Um, at the end of the day, who stands to benefit more if people live longer, healthier lives than a life insurance company? I mean, it's kind of simple economics, I suppose, but, but beyond just the economic gain, we should really be there. So at the same time, we're sort of dealing with the, the unfortunate outcomes uh, of the virus, uh, you know, paying those benefits to loved ones, which is, which is our core responsibility. We're very much engaging our existing customers with new types of life insurance that provide them incentives and education and rewards and such to take steps uh, to live a longer, healthier life. We can talk about it more, but, but we obviously kind of play two roles at the back end, but along the way, can't we, shouldn't we as an industry be at the table trying to improve health outcomes? Who do you find is most resistant to your being at the table? Uh, oddly enough, no one, when, when you sort of, you know, it, I don't know, it's, it's a weird thing. We sit around and say, you know, for 150 years, we issued life insurance policies on people and sat back and said, geez, Rick, sure hope you live a long, healthy life because that works out well for you and works out well for us. But we thought it was sort of profoundly odd that we didn't do anything to help you achieve that outcome. So, you know, from the moment we started doing this, both the customers and everyone really in the value chain says, Gee, it sort of makes sense that a life insurance company would want me to live a long, healthy life. 
and it's been quite welcoming as we've tried to launch these new programs. So in some ways, it was just a more passive strategy or approach. Well, we were very passive in the past. We literally sat back and said, hope you live a long, healthy life. <laughs> now, now we're very, very engaged. I, I just as a quick example, we used to engage with our customers once or twice a year when we sent you a bill or something. We're engaging with our customers about 40 times a month now through an app where we provide, I'll get in, I can get into the program later if you're interested, but we provide different incentives and rewards, a points program. Hey, for 40? 40, yeah, so. I, I wonder if that's overkill. <laughs> now, <laughs> you, might, you might think, you're probably thinking to yourself, who on earth wants to interact with their life insurance company 40 <laughs> times a month? But um, if the program is one where every, think about it as like a frequent flyer program where, you know, in the, in the mileage program, the more you fly, the more points you get, you get the status. Life insurance, every time you do something that's healthy, take some steps, see your doctor, buy healthy foods, you get points. And then like every 10th workout you complete, your mobile device will shake and you get to spin this wheel that looks like the wheel of fortune and you get five bucks at, at uh, iTunes or $10 at Amazon. So anyways, I, I won't bore you with all the details, but it's actually fun. And I know the word fun and life insurance has never gone together before. <laughs> Well, let me, let me go to the, the whole group now with a, a more personal question. And if anyone can share um, your own lived experience of someone you know who's been dealing with a chronic disease during this pandemic, it could be even yourself. So, anyone uh, want to jump I'll, in? I'll start, Rick. Um, so, you know, people who know me know I love my mom. Um, you know, I, I was uh, born in, in Jamaica, but raised in Florida, and my mother kind of shepherded us through a lot um, and, you know, made education kind of a key cornerstone of our lives as a way to improve our, um, our social standing and financial standing at the time. And just a wonderful lady. Always been, you know, she's always been very, um, very um, detailed, very healthy, very, you know, paying attention. If, if there were three pills um, left in her pill bottle, you knew that the prescription needed to be filled in three days. She had been always on top of everything and never missed an appointment. And you know, after, um, you know, as we kind of wane into about the, the second month of COVID, and then the third month, um, I realized that, you know, she wasn't breathing as well. Um, and that when she was going up the stairs, um, you know, things just looked a little bit more dramatic. And um, just because of the history I just told you in terms of, of kind of how I view my mom and how we, I was just very attentive. And, you know, was really surprised to, to find out that she had been um, delaying a lot of her things that she should have been doing for her own care because she was so worried about getting the virus. And the concept of getting the virus was just so overwhelming. She'd been seeing it on the media, uh, you know, her friends, all of her little old lady cute friends who I love to death. Um, you know, they're all they're super worried and, and they wouldn't come within 15 feet of each other, much less six feet um, for fear of just, you know, transmission. And, you know, it highlighted for me um, just, again, the multiple sides to this pandemic. Um, and, you know, but when we finally got her in to see her our primary care physician, it was, I think, you know, in a pretty timely manner, meaning, you know, I don't think waiting much longer would have been a good thing. Um, but it highlighted what I was saying before when I started off my discussion with access um, and why, why it got been so emotional for me um, and why, you know, we've been involved in this thing around pushing people to get uh, their preventative care during the pandemic. Don't forget about your own health. It just highlighted to me how we got to take care of ourselves and the people we love and that COVID is real. There's a lot occurring with COVID, especially in minority communities, but, um, but there's, a, there's an impact of chronic disease in the, in the background um, and we really, really, really have to take care of each other. Um, you know, and then understanding, you know, when's the appropriate time for care and the appropriate time to seek care and make sure that we keep people connected to their care providers. And when you think about your mother, I mean, how fortunate she is to have her son in this, in this world of medicine. So think of all the most people who don't have that advantage. Oh, you know, I, I mean, and, and Rick, I mean, you know, if my mom, you know, trips and falls, you know, I jump in to try to catch her. You know I mean? I don't want her to have a scratch or, a, or anything just because of how much she means to, to us. And, you know, at 82, she just, she, she's 82. Um, so it comes with all the good and bad related to 82. And, and just, again, just to emphasize, I guess, just this message from, 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 you know, from us, which is just, you know, making sure that people still continue to seek care outside of all the preventative things they need to do um, in terms of the pandemic. I think, you know, Rick, a word that comes to mind listening to Garth and just thinking about some of my acquaintances living with chronic diseases is, is, is fear. 
you know, yeah. we, we all carry some measure of fear about what's going on with this virus, but particularly a friend of mine living with lupus, I mean, literally has only left her house in four months to go out into the yard, not beyond, in four months. That's the level of fear she has. I'm not judging that. We can say it's rational or not, but literally four months. And uh, people living with diabetes, I mean, we've seen, sure, some of my fellow panelists have the stats, statistics down more than I do, but, you know, seeing that, uh, you know, person living with controlled uh, diabetes has like a 1% fatality rate, uncontrolled, like 11% or something. And, and we're sitting here saying as an industry, how do we engage people living with diabetes, uh, make sure they have life insurance, and then help them, you know, take the steps necessary to, to keep it under control because the outcomes are so different. But I just, um, I just think about fear a lot right now. And, um, and as I'm sure some of my, my medical professionals, fellow medical professionals in the field, uh, the panel could say that fear in and of itself probably isn't particularly healthy, right? That's right. I've, I've noticed that in some of my family members that have uh, chronic disease, the um, staying home and working from home has completely disrupted their routines. Uh, they're not getting exercise like they usually do. Their diets have completely changed. Um, and in terms of controlling hypertension and obesity, uh, just these lifestyle changes that the coronavirus has imposed upon us um, is, is really not good for their health. Jana, do you have? I think the only one as an immigrant in this country being so far away from my mother listening mm -hmm. to Carthio's story and my parents and worrying about them worrying about who is taking care of them when I'm so far away. I think that has been my main concern. And right. I think that is a concern of many of us who have our loved ones outside of the country when the world is no longer as global as it used to be. This is, this is just so hard for all of us because in, in some ways when, Brooks, you're talking about fear, in some ways that I can see a positive to that and people's not being reckless about going out. Like you, you, you don't want certain people going out and endangering themselves but there draws a line when it comes to, it's too extreme or they're endangering themselves by not getting the, the, the treatment they need. Well, I mean, Garth, you were talking about programs to sort of get people access to get them to the doctors. Um, Susan, you're talking about the AMA's programs to sort of help people um, get, get um, deal with their chronic d diseases. How do we, what do we tell people? Because it's a mixed message with, it's dangerous to go out, yet we want people to get medical um, help. So how, how do we do that? You know, um, Brooks brought up a good point about fear. One of the things we have to do is to work to have people be informed, empowered, but not necessarily fearful. Um, you can make, you know, educated decisions about social distancing that's made with, um, from, from empowerment, but not out of fear. And going to my kind of earlier point about um, you know, this initiative, the, the, the Time for Care initiative, we're encouraging people um, to interact more with their physicians, inter or interact more with their primary care setting, um, and interact more with um, the, the things that would make them healthier. And the idea here is to just dispel the overwhelming fear that people have in terms of making decisions that would make their life better, and to give them all the information so that they can equate both the benefits risks and the benefits and do the right thing. But, you know, I think Brooke's right that, you know, one of the things um, that I would like to see happen is move from a culture of fear um, and a culture of empowerment and giving folks the tools to make all those decisions within that context. Now, as we're all dealing with the practicalities of fear, I mean, the other practical reality for a lot of people, millions is joblessness. And Yana, you had said that this that COVID is sort of a rude awakening to, to how joblessness is tied to, to chronic diseases. Can you explain that? Yes. For an economist, this is a, a terrifying crisis because of, we are used to financial crises. They happen. It's purely economic. But now you have a health and economic crisis that is hitting most vulnerable populations doubly hard. We know chronic decisions and oftentimes the person-to-person -person interactive jobs in lower income segments and certain mi minorities make them much more vulnerable for the disease. But on the other hand, they also face the economic vulnerability of the shelter in place and lockdown policies around the globe. We estimate that roughly a third of jobs in the US alone are vulnerable to either reduced hours or closures or, or job losses. 
because of the nature of the jobs that they are the ones that are most impacted by the economic policies um, of the shelter in place policies and others that have economic implications and 80 percent of those vulnerable jobs earn less than $40,000 a year. So it really is a tough time for many folks in those segments. So that this is a particularly unequal crisis. Um, I wanted to just quickly jump on, the, on, the, on, on your previous question, if I may, on what can we do to make sure that healthcare continues to deliver even at this kind of a time? And I think this is one of the things that makes us really excited about this time. We are seeing digital solutions come and solve many of the problems. Things like telehealth, self-care, finding ways for people to care for, care for themselves more. Ideas, some that Brooks, your, your industry has already done, but also in many of the other places. And real-time data, data, people need to track what's happening to the COVID patients, patients all the time. I think that is an opportunity for us to do that much more broadly for chronic diseases, even after COVID is gone. So that's the kinds of examples that make us optimistic and think, this really is the time. Can, can any, anyone, can you or anyone give an example of use of tech, AI or technology that in this pandemic that is really helping people in a way they weren't helped before? Well, the, the use of telemedicine has exploded um, since the beginning of the pandemic. I've heard it said that we've experienced 10 years growth of telemedicine experience in about 10 weeks time. Um, and so, it, it, I have really been impressed with how many of my patients um, have felt comfortable uh, using a telemedicine platform, going to see the, the doctor um, on their iPhone or their iPad. Um, and it has made healthcare accessible for people that um, just really didn't feel comfortable using their phone. So it has been a lifeline. And I think it's going to be critical to make sure that we can maintain telemedicine uh, policies in the future so that patients can still have that line to their physicians um, who can continue to pro provide that care remotely. Yeah, Susan, I can't tell you how many friends I've had that have said, I can't believe I used to haul myself into the city all the time to see my doctor when you know, half the time I could have just done what we're doing here. I mean, some, some amount of time you still have to go and we have a telemedicine solution and we, we came out with a life insurance product just for people living with diabetes and a, and a telemedicine a diabetes management care platform is, is woven into that a company called Unduo. And uh, it's just wonderful, right? When we talked earlier about fear and people not wanting to leave the home to be able to continue to access uh, a physician or other types of care virtually is, is just uh, wonderful. And, you know, some things we, we all probably debate what will go back to the old way post COVID and what won't change. Telemedicine is one of those things. Susan, I think you're spot on is, is here to stay. I don't think that's going to be a, a phenomena that unwinds post-COVID. Garth, let, let me ask you, because this ties into the whole access question of, of telemedicine does give more people access in a certain way, but there, there are certain people who, who can't benefit or uh, afford telemedicine or get those services. How does that play into all of this? Yeah, you know, so telemedicine, um, I think, has been one of those evolving empowerment tools that allow people to get care in a lot of uh, different ways. But it's also um, important to, uh, to understand, Rick, that um, sometimes it's actually needed and appropriate for you to show up at the physician's office to be able to get some of the diagnostic tools that uh, may not be available in a, in a telemedicine um, setting, but is, um, is um, equally important to keeping you healthy. So the right balance um, is important. Now, the, the interesting thing that Susan alluded to, um, getting to this concept of access that's happening, is the explosion of telemedicine. So the idea that it's really reaching into the tentacles of um, not just, you know, where things were before, but rural and urban communities and, um, you know, people of all different walks of life and telemedicine is evolving in different varied forms. And, you know, one of the, the, the biggest obstacles, I would say, was even providers like myself who sometimes felt uncomfortable with the kinds of things that, um, you know, we, we thought we needed that we didn't need and things we do need that we don't need and really evolving to understand what's really needed to provide the best care for patients. But I do think that um, telemedicine is... Um, 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 a tool that is really kind of penetrating both rural and urban communities to get to some of those folks who desperately um, needed care the most. Can, can you all talk a little about the, when we talk about chronic diseases, um, which ones might you see as sort of the most severe in terms of risk factors for hospitalization due to, from COVID? I mean, there's, there's, obesity, obviously, and there, there, there are other chronic diseases. Could you, could you talk a little about that? 
specifically? Uh, I'll be happy to weigh in on that. Uh, of course, we know that patients over 65 um, are at higher risk or those that are in uh, long-term care facilities. We know that patients with heart conditions, but also patients with chronic kidney disease, chronic liver disease, um, those who are immunocompromised with diseases like HIV AIDS, uh, you know, these folks are all being put at greater risk um, because of COVID-19. And, you know, and like, um, but it, it, everybody is at risk. Um, and since a lot of people are afraid to go to the doctor, um, it's, you know, it's been interesting. Even 911 calls have gone down um, since the pandemic began. Um, Chicago, New York have reported like a 30% decrease in the number of 911 calls. Not only are patients afraid to go to the doctor, they're afraid to go to the hospital when they're really sick. Um, mm -hmm. I have some family members who are paramedics and I can, uh, that, that has definitely been their experience. That, that they're just not getting calls like they used to. Uh, people are ignoring serious things like chest pain and um, other, you know, appendicitis and things like that that can be treated early and safely even in the COVID era. Uh, right. And it's important to keep those lines of communication open. Well, you know, Susan touched on something that, I mean, just deeply troubles me. Um, and that is the rate at which people are not showing up in the emergency room for chest pain. Mm -hmm. People who have, you know, angina, um, coronary artery disease, and staying at home and dying from heart attacks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we saw the amount of folks presenting for um, heart disease-related plummet the way it did, um, you know, as people, as this culture of fear, as Brooke said, kind of started to take over more, that concerned me because that makes me realize that people are dying at home. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like we, it's not like they're all of a sudden things have been, um, you know, cured. It was cured all of a sudden in April, and you know, the, the rate of heart disease just change is really that people are suffering at home. Yes. And so again, you know, just getting this message out to folks that, you know, being responsible about COVID does not does not contradict with being responsible about your own care. Um, and that the two are actually synonymous if you mm -hmm. if if we educate patients um, appropriately and you know, give them some of the right tools. But scary when I just think of my my patients who may be sitting at home, you know, dying, you know, or in, in pain or suffering or something anywhere along that spectrum. I mean, when Susan said that, it just, it just something that's always really just bothered me. So how do you practically, I know you all have programs to do this, but how do you practically get to someone to tell them you need to go to the doctor? Can I jump in here just pick on the innovation question? I think Garth and Susan yeah. can probably help, but one thing, that this is an example that comes from Iceland. Uh, oh. It's Sidekick was a startup with a few years of experience before COVID who had built an at-home diagnostic tool that then basically allowed people to follow the folks who are at home on COVID isolation. And this app, they basically, it's developed from a game and it is anybody who is on that system now is sent a link to download an app. They need to twice a day fill in the details that then feeds directly into a care provider who can monitor hundreds of, of patients at the same time. And then basically triage and say, hey, either it's an emergency, they sent an ambulance, whether the person uh, is there or not. They can call that person if it's kind of a, a yellow, if you want the color in the, on, the, on the piece, or they can provide them just a text saying, do this or that. There's no reason we couldn't have that more broadly for people who are at elevated risk, particularly in this environment. So that's one of those innovations that could potentially help. I, I read that sort of fascinating piece by Elizabeth Colbert of the New Yorker the, recently this is, Iceland is like has solved the COVID problem they, they, because they've been so proactive and ingenious in taking this seriously. So it seems like there are lessons to learn from yeah. that country. But I wonder how the U.S. though could scale it in that same way, given how big we are. Well, it would be a pretty dramatic scaling, but um, just telemedicine technology where a physician or a nurse can just eyeball a patient really quickly and go, okay, this is not a telemedicine issue. You need to go to the hospital right now and call 911. And we have more tools like portable home pulse oximeters that patients can have. And, and we can say, okay, if your number goes below 92, 90, whatever the doctor feels is appropriate for that patient, you've got to go to the hospital. And so I think putting the technology in patients' hands to help give them, okay, this is it. This is where the red flag, red flag goes up, but I need to go in. That's a great point. And the, the sort of personal, the consumer technology 
health-related technology that to some extent is here. I, mean, I don't know what everybody wears. I've got an Apple Watch 5 on. It does some pretty cool things. But what's coming there? I, I was with the leader of a very large uh, tech company recently, and they said, you know, Brooks, the average automobile has 400 sensors in it now or some number like that. The average human has none. That's going to change. And it's not, you know, it's not tomorrow, although for some customers it's today, right? Some people do have, but I think the power of technology, personal health technology is going to scale so dramatically. You see a lot of the companies now with COVID even looking for apps and uh, uh, wearables and other things that can give you clues, you know, do it, might I have this, might I not, um, things like that, just to tell you to how you get to the doctor, uh, uh, very powerful and, and lots going to change in the coming years on that. Are, one, one something we've seen with COVID all along is that the data has been very difficult. It's very hard to know who's infected, who's dying, how, how to break it down demographically uh, and, and ge geographically. The um, do you do you all think we're underestimating the people dying from uh, not from COVID, but from not going to get medical attention? I think that um, I think that is is coming to an extent so far, but I think that's the longer this goes, the more that builds. I mean, we can we we get a lot of data on deaths, obviously, right? And we could we could tell early on that COVID was being underreported because we saw unusual death activity that at the moment you couldn't totally explain. In retrospect, we can um, now. It's, it's interesting. There, you look at different causes of death. One cause of death is down, and that's accidents, which is to be expected, right? Which, which is a higher cost of death in the US now. So that's down because of less mobility, those starting to change. Um, but I think, you're, I think you're right, and that has sort of a building effect, right? The longer people go without getting treatment um, for chronic condition and other, others, the more those deaths are, start gonna, are gonna start to build. So I do think there's some underreporting there. Well, I think that the right kind of data is going to be very important. Uh, AMA has called upon um, the federal government and HHS to um, start collecting data now um, to disaggregate the data. How has COVID affected uh, communities of color, various populations, various parts of the country, so that we can make this data publicly available and um, all the race and ethnicity data um, pertaining to COVID so that we can better understand its impact in the future um, and its true response. You know, um, Susan uh, said something that is so important to even our strategy that we've employed around testing um, COVID and trying to disaggregate challenge. I often tell people right now there's almost two pandemics occurring. There's a, the pandemic that, that in terms of some numbers and testing that we see, and then there's what's happening in, in racial and ethnic minority communities. And you see, you know, for instance, um, not just the morbidity and mortality rates and death rates, but even as we, we've expanded a lot of testing to the African-American Hispanic communities, you see a very, very high positive rate um, in terms of just the overall testing positivity within those communities. And if you really try and extrapolate what's happening there, you see where the pandemic has taken, has not only ravaged those communities now, but may potentially continue to be ravaging those communities in the near future. And so our ability to kind of disaggregate and strategize appropriately is going to um, um, uh, rest very much on our idea to understand what the pandemic means to certain communities. Because in many cases, Rick, it's a very different pandemic depending on where you live and your background. And that, that's not, I know it's not a new theme at all, but, but seeing how, who's been impacted by this the most and how underserved those segments of our society have been by so many of our institutions and frankly, so many of our industries. I know looking at my own industry, the life insurance industry, this is gonna sound like a crazy statement for a leader of a life insurance company. I was a bit saddened by how few death claims we've been seeing. Um, and I say saddened in a way, I mean that in a societal way, that if you just looked at the raw number of people dying, you say, oh, we should have X number of, of claims being filed. Well, un unfortunately, so many of the people uh, dying from COVID um, haven't been served well. They don't tend to have life insurance as much. And, and part of the real takeaway from this for me has been, we've got to serve, we knew it before, but it's put an exclamation point on the fact that we have to serve a broader swath of US consumers more effectively. There are many underrepresented segments in our industry. Um, people living with diabetes, for example, we did a survey 
over 50% of people living with diabetes think they can't qualify for life insurance. Hmm. And you know, you know what percent got a, approved that applied last year? 88%. So we've got we've to let people know that, our, that not, and I'm going to start talking about life insurance, a lot of parts of our, our, our institutions, right? Certain healthcare systems, things like that. Unfortunately, the people that are dying, so many of the people that are dying, haven't been served well historically. We've got to serve them better going forward. So heaven forbid the next thing rolls around, um, they're better protected in a lot of ways. Well, you know, and, and go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that just in general, that COVID has um, shined a very bright light on where the cracks are in our um, healthcare system uh, and in our society in general. Um, and, you know, we need to use this as an opportunity um, to, to work on those areas. And um, but boy, it sure has put them under a magnifying glass. Mm -hmm. Well said, Susan. You know, we've done, um, particularly on the testing front, um, we have had a very heavy focus on African-American, Hispanic, and other minority communities. So the vast majority of our retail testing sites from CVS and um, are, are in areas of high social vulnerable um, index. Um, and so the areas that are, um, um, you know, um, have a higher rate of social challenges and social determinants of health. And to Susan's point, you know, um, how, we, how we work together when that light is shown, you know, how do we, um, how do we kind of quickly evolve to address the problem? Once the data um, uh, becomes available, is important. And I think testing um, is in a, and directing testing is, is one of those ways in which I think we've quickly evolved. And I think we 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 would like to see kind of the rest of um, the testing apparatus quickly evolve into how we can um, you know go ahead and target um, a lot of testing directed towards um, minority communities where we know a lot of the challenges are. And just as a, as an economist, one uh, quick point. I think the economic cost or the stress coming from the economic uncertainty is hitting exceptionally hard those same communities. So unfortunately, even after, if we, if we beat the virus, I think there's going to be a long leg of related challenges facing those exactly same communities. You know, this is, this is, um, this whole pandemic has also, I think, highlighted some societal, uh, vast societal differences and tensions. Um, um, you um, talk, talked about, Brooks, you talk about the, we, talk, we all talk about the fear, but we also talk about people who are very dismissive of what's, what's happening here. And I, you know, one, I have to share with you an email I got yesterday that was just appall alarming and appalling to me where we, we introduced a, um, a new tracker where people could go look at sort of cases around the world in different counties and where they, uh, what the rates of infection are in a sort of dynamic way. And I got a note from a reader who said, why are you being alarmist about this? This COVID doesn't touch more than 1% of the population, who, who cares? And I've also was at, at an event before everything was virtual where a woman got up who was actually a middle-aged woman and said, why do we care? This is only going to affect old people. Why do we care? And I, I worry about these fissures in society and how that's affecting care and how we're, we're all reacting to this. Well, and I think of one important manifestation of that is many people's attitudes about wearing masks. We know that wearing a mask, washing your hands, uh, keeping your distance um, is the best way to prevent the spread. Um, and yet um, there have been some people that are just violently opposed to wearing a mask. Um, whereas other people, and including myself, and I think this is the right way to look at it, um, when you wear a mask, you're protecting other people because there's so much uh, asymptomatic disease going around. And wearing a mask is not uh, an insult to your freedom. It's not a political statement. It's an act of kindness to help keep your community safe uh, because that old person that dying, that's dying might be your grandmother, uh, might be the cute little old lady across the street, uh, might be Garth's mother. And um, so everybody in our society is important, but uh, wearing masks uh, shouldn't be a political statement. Right. Well, one thing about messaging, I want to ask, ask Garth because you were in, I, I think in, the Obama and Bush administrations, you were, I think in both administrations, director of the Minority Health Office and the mm -hmm. HHS, is that right? That is correct. Um, 
And we had a, a story in Stad on Monday where we um, we talked to people involved in the Minority Health Office and in the administration, and there was a general view that um, they haven't been very prominent or involved in a in a very public way um, in uh, being an advocate for the hardest hit communities. And you know, I, I I'm curious what you think about that. And like, if you're if you're someone who's affected um, in this deep way by COVID and you're um, um, and you want an advocate, where do you go? And I'm not, I'm not talking politics one way or the other, but I'm just talking sure. governmentally, who, mm -hmm. do you go, who would you go to in the federal government and who in your local government? Is there an advocate for people dealing with these equity issues? Oh, Rick, you bring up things near and dear to my, my <laughs> career and heart. Um, let me stop by and tell you one, one you know, this, I've, for, outside of government in my current role, I spent a lot of years as a researcher um, researching um, issues related to um, African-American and Hispanic communities. So I've tried to look at it from a number of different lenses. I'll tell you that one conclusion I've come to is this idea of shared responsibility for these problems. And so the challenges that we face, especially when you think about the long arc of social determinants of health and housing, transportation, and everything that goes along with that, you start to think through that it, it filters through the federal government, the local government, into the private sector, um, which is why I take my role so seriously um, into, into academics and into, into even into families and local communities. So I do believe there is a shared responsibility for how we transform these communities um, that goes from the treetops to the grassroots, the grassroots to the treetops. Now, the thing is, um, as my dad often say, with responsibility um, comes outcomes. Um, and we like to see that you know, if you have that shared responsibility, you're working towards outcomes. That's why I mentioned a lot of, in terms of what we've been doing around testing and um, some of the things we've been able to see by getting heavily involved. But uh, we do need a collective voice, Rick. We do need a, a, a voice that goes across all channels. Um, and we do need, I think, a um, heightened level of awareness now that we've realized more than ever um, that um, not just COVID, but um, coronary artery disease, hypertension, diabetes will and continue to impact minority communities. Last thing I'll say on this point, in 1985, um, 1986, Secretary Margaret Heckler at the time, that led to the establishment of that office, issued a report that showed that um, the infant mortality rate between black communities when compared to the general population was twice compared to the general population. Black babies were dying at twice the rate compared to the general population. That was 1985, 1986. Fast forward over the past 40 or so years, and that statistic has remained fluctuating since, since was relatively constant. And that to, that to me serves as, um, in public health world, we know infant mortality is the backbone for how we define a society. So even beyond COVID, that particular statistic and a whole lot of making sure kids can make their first year of life and the disparity in that statistic, I think remains a black eye on our country and something that we should all be committed to. Again, like I said, from the treetops to the grassroots. But what would you, if you could wave your magic wand, what, how, would, how would any of you address this in a more uh, aggressive Ooh. way? Can I wave my magic wand? Yes. Can I do a little bit of waving? Yeah, um, so I think there are concrete things to do, right? So there are clinical interventions, we know, um, particularly in talking about infant mortality, same thing with COVID. We know that testing matters for um, right now, is particularly for black and brown communities. So we need to get testing here. Um, so there are all their clinical interventions that, um, that um, we all can be a part of in, in different ways. But then we also, again, thinking back to this group, thinking back to the government, we have to collectively raise our voices around those social factors that disproportionately drive these, these, um, these disparities. And then how do we all collectively advocate um, around housing um, and all the other socioeconomic things that impact all of these clinical outcomes? At the American Medical Association, we've created a Center for Health Equity. And um, one of our goals with this center 
is to embed uh, the importance of health equity in everything that we do, whether it's in our chronic disease prevention programs, whether it's in medical education, um, whether it's in patient education, that it always needs to be a part of the discussion. Um, and that center has been going for about a year now and, and doing some great things. But um, it, it, it can't be a subject all on its own. It's got to be a part of every other subject you're talking about. One area. Rick, I was going to just say, no, Aletha and the leadership you have there, Susan, is a perfect Aletha example. Aletha Maybank, of shared, yes. Of shared responsibility, of what she's been able to accomplish. It's just an example of what I would want to see all of us work together to accomplish. So I didn't mean to interrupt you. But. Oh, no, that's fine. Uh, one particular area I was just going to say that we've been focused on is, is nutrition. Um, we, I don't know, I learned the hard way that you can't exercise your way to good health at some point. Nutrition matters an awful lot. And uh, certainly within our life insurance program that I mentioned that sort of incentivizes and rewards uh, healthy behavior, we, we offer 25% off healthy food purchases at over 17,000 grocery stores nationwide, trying to make our motto is sort of like make the healthy choice the easy choice. So sometimes healthy foods are more expensive, provide that discount. Um, we're not touching, I wish we were touching more parts of our, uh, of our society. We're, we're committed to doing that. Um, so at the same time, I know we've been engaging uh, politicians in Washington, talking about some of the governmental food programs and, and some of the, where the subsidies go, incentives and rewards and so forth embedded in those food programs to try to uh, in, encourage good nutrition uh, for, for all ages and, and all segments of our society. And if I had my magic wand moment, yeah. for me, it really would be making and keeping health everyone's business. And because 70% of the improvements in health happen before people actually go and see a doctor because something is wrong. And today we really leave it to the doctors and the medical system to take care of it. And it needs to be our neighborhoods. It needs to be where the kids grow up, where old people have a, a, a rich, safe life. And it really is from our neighborhoods to the workplaces, to the transportation system, we need to kind of keep health at the agenda for most industries. And I think this is, again, one of those times when we can do it because now it is there. Let's just keep, keep it on the table. Let me, let you, you four are, are such a, a smart group with really interesting perspectives. I want to give you an assignment and, um, uh, and that is- I got to write, write, write it down, make sure I do it. <laughs> now, this may seem, uh, but I think sometimes it's important to sort of um, sort of look back a little bit and and um, do some scenarios. So let's pretend for a minute that the the five of us are in a room one year ago in um, in June of 2019, and we were telling and, and I told you that I have information that this pandemic is coming. You know, early next year. What are, can you come up as a group with sort of five steps that, that this, that you all would do in your organizations and your companies that the government should do to, that would have helped us if we had anticipated this a year ago, what are what five steps we could do that would have mitigated the, the death and, and devastation? I'm going to jump in right away, and I think that it would have been to um, start stockpiling personal protective equipment. Um, we have not had enough PPE all along, and um, that has been a huge problem. And, and now that's seeping into other industries because they're realizing if they want to open safely, they've got to have PPE for their employees and their customers as well. And so I would have um, really ramped up the supply chain and made sure that we had multiple sources that were reliable, uh, inexpensive, um, and that every, every business, especially from the small practice doctor to the greatest healthcare system, um, was able to protect its healthcare workers and its patients right away. I'm, I'm sad to say that this may be a controversial statement. I hope not. First of all, spot on, Susan, but I'd say testing, have testing like scaled up and ready to go at massive I don't know, I can't believe I'm saying that might be somewhat controversial. I hope it's not, but um, hopefully not for this group at least. <laughs> but, um, you know, in, in retrospect to have, uh, you know, just widely, widely available testing from the outset, uh, I think could have made a huge difference. You know, the, the only thing I would add is um, cont investment in public health. 
Um, I think um, investing in public health as a backbone for um, our, our healthcare system and you know, what the community is important. I also want to go back to something that we started out with, Rick, which is this idea of chronic diseases and making sure that even as the pandemic started and was making its way through an infectious standpoint, we continue to highlight um, the importance of people continuing to get care. To Brooks's earlier point, dispelling fear, empowering people where appropriate. So I mentioned that um, you know what we were going to be doing around um, the time for care initiative, encouraging people to get preventative care now through the through at this point of the pandemic, et cetera. But I think um, emphasizing that all the way through from the beginning, so that people understood. Yes, there are things you need to do when COVID hits, um, but yes, there are things you need to do to continue to maintain your health through this time period. I think is particularly important. And and I would just add to that by you know a year out may not have been a big enough amount of time to make a huge difference but one of the things for sure that's that's happening during this I know why it is for me I think we're all much more mindful of our baseline health mm. uh, you, we all see the outcomes the COVID outcomes depending on you know, how healthy you are you going into it so I know again in our industry we're trying to engage our clients and help their just you know even absent you know well ahead of the next uh, virus heaven forbid you know help all of society just improve our baseline health to have better outcomes when these things inevitably hit. Um, and I would add from the business perspective, uh, just you mentioned, Susan, the, the PPE, because all the businesses are thinking about how they can open without increasing the risk to their employers yeah. and employees and their, and their workers. If we had one year ahead of time, I think we would have very different digital tools in all hospitals, all, mm -hmm. all chronic disease folks. We would have quite different tools probably for touching elevators for doing, we could actually do a lot beforehand if we had the time. So I surely hope that when we come out of this, we'll end up in a place where the next pandemic will be less dramatic, less shocking, less short, shortfall of everything, and we'll be more prepared. Well, I think, I think we should recommend that the Milken people put together a blue ribbon task force with the four of you in sort of giving advice for the next pandemic. Because I think even though you all have different perspectives, you kind of, there's a lot of commonalities that I think would be really interesting. Let me, before we go, we have like five minutes left. Let me just ask each of you to give very specific practical <laughs> advice if you're a patient um, who's um, dealing with um, chronic disease or could potentially like, What's your practical advice to someone right now dealing with this in, uh, for people in different communities who are, on the one hand, maybe afraid to go out, on another hand, maybe think this, this whole thing is overblown, on another hand, they don't want to sort of endanger other people. Like, what do you, could each of you give some just direct advice to, to someone who might be listening here? I don't think that we can say too much to wear a mask, wash your hands, keep your distance. Um, I just, it, we still have to be very vigilant about that. Uh, it's the only thing that we have to help slow the spread of this virus. And just in a more general way, playing off Susan's comments, I would just say, you know, follow the science. Like it, it's, it's so, Amen. so <laughs> everything's kind of, forgive the, casual term, but crazy right now, right? Like it's just it's wild. And um, and I'm not making any judgment on any side of anything. I'm just saying like, we we're all buffeted, buffeted around by these uh, perspectives and opinions. And and at the core, this is a matter of science. And, and you know, Rick, I, I very much commend the work you're doing with Stad and, and, and uh, everyone here, just like follow the science, like try to push out the noise and that, and that back to the earlier point, maybe means a little less fear, a little more knowledge, follow the science. Oh, I, I want to say it better that. myself. I was gonna say, I was gonna say, I want to just exclamate ditto and claim a lot of the stuff Brooks just said um, because I think that's important. And as I do, like when I talk to my mom and you know my own family, I say just take care of ourselves. Um, we don't, you know, move beyond fear. And I say move to empowerment. And then you know, thinking through, you know, taking care of yourself does mean sometimes distancing appropriately. Many times, that's what it definitely what it means. But it also means going to see the doctor. Um, as you should um, in, w in whatever form, if you need to be there in person, if you need to do telemedicine, doing what's appropriate. So um, as I mentioned a couple of times before, that's a big thing for us now in terms of emphasizing that it's time for care in whatever way, shape or form is appropriate for you. Yeah, and I would add the only thing here is that 
social distancing doesn't mean uh, social isolation. Don't be afraid to ask for help. There's going to be someone who can help you. And at the same time, be the one who is going to help. I think we are seeing the rise of caring for your neighbor, even beyond your family, um, in, in a way that I think, I hope it will stay. And hopefully that will make our uh, neighborhoods safer, but also more resilient. Well, that's all sound advice. And um, I appreciate Jana, Garth, Brooks, and Susan. Um, it's, this has been a, a great, um, thoughtful conversation. And um, I appreciate uh, all the people that have tuned in today to, to listen to you. And I'm hoping that, um, that we can all meet sometime in person when this is all over. So, um, so let's hope that people take your advice and this thing ends before, before too long. But I also appreciate the positivity that you all are searching for in some, some of the bright spots and what we're learning from this whole horrid experience. So I appreciate that. And thanks again for, for participating and have a good rest of the day. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you.